presenting himself. Uh, okay. <laughs> How Shaul is presenting himself immediately prior to his death, right? So in the first story, what is featured is Shaul's fear, okay? Shaul is extremely afraid, and not only is he extremely afraid, but his servant, right, his weapons bearer is also extremely afraid, and his death comes about as a result of his fear. In the second story, what is more emphasized is his weakness, right? Um, and, and you know, that, that I think is also a significant difference. What was Shaul's state of uh, saying, whether or not you can hear me? Can you hear me? No, still not? Oh, you can? Oh, great. Okay, fine. All right, so let's uh, pull up the PowerPoint again. Okay. So I don't know what point uh, um, we lost each other, but the the, the question that 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 I want to begin by addressing, which is I think a very basic question, is who gets a death story, right? In other words, not everybody gets a death story. It's the same the same question could be asked about birth, right? Certainly everybody is born, right? But not everybody gets an elaborate story of their birth in the Tanakh. When you do have a birth story, one of the first things you want to ask is is why did this particular biblical character get a birth story or is what's important about his birth that you know that 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 merits him this 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 separate story about his birth i think we can ask the same question with regard to death stories we have some figures who don't die at all right we we never see rifka die right she just kind of disappears from the story i don't know adam never dies right he just kind of disappears from the story and many many others who die, we get kind of, you know, a half a pasuk about their death, right? You know, and Yitzchak died and Gideon died. But this idea that you have this whole elaborate story about one's death, we have it in several stories, right? This isn't the only story where we have quite an elaborate story of someone's death. But the question is, is why would someone get a death story? And I think that with, with any of these uh, situations, we have to ask ourselves, what does this story contribute to our understanding of the broader trajectory of this person's life, right? There's, what do we know about Shaul and how does the story of his death um, deepen our understanding about Shaul? So I will say one thing about his death, and this also, it, it, it might seem obvious, but I, I don't think it's obvious at all. And that is that Shaul dies in battle. That is not considered to be a good story in Tanakh. Why do I say it in that way? Because, of course, that's very, very, very different than Greek literature, right? In Greek literature, death in battle is the desired result, right? Uh, Achilles has this whole um, uh, speech in, in, in chapter nine in the Iliad where he talks about, about, you know, he wants to die in battle. If you die in battle, you get something called kleos, which means glory, right? Because that is the, the, the desired end of, of, of Greek hero's life, right? And that I don't think is true in Tanakh. In Tanakh, we have three kings who die in battle. We have Ahav, we have Shaul, and we have Yoshiahu. Both Ahav and Shaul are very problematic stories. And Yoshiahu, who is quite a righteous figure, uh, the rabbinic commentaries spend a great deal of time trying to understand exactly why he had to die in battle. And we do have a pasuk in Divrei Yamim, which seems to suggest that it was also as a result of something that he had done in his lifetime. We won't go in that direction for the moment, but I think it's important to understand that when we do have this story of Shaul's death in battle, we want to ask ourselves, why? Why is his life cut short in this way? Why doesn't he continue to be king of Israel? And I think that the other point that has to be made here is that not only does Shaul uh, his life end somewhat in the middle of his career, but his 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 life's career doesn't continue. He does not create a dynasty, and in that sense, he certainly is a failed king. So I would posit that maybe his death story is going to tell us something more about his failure, about why he does not succeed in launching a, a monarchical dynasty. I will say that we have actually. Um, several psukim, several verses, and also some rabbinic commentary that tells us very, very explicitly that Shaul's death in battle 
is a result of his sins, right? So if you look at this verse in Divrei Hayamim, in chapter 10, Vayamo Shaul bima'alo asher ma'al bahashem. Shaul died as a result of the sin in his rebellion against God. He didn't keep the word of God. The Gamli Shaoba Ovli Dro. She went to that uh that that witch from, from Endor, right? And he asked, you know, he, he asked witchcraft. So, you know, the, the Psukamir offer different understandings, but the basic understanding is that Shaul died as a result of his sins. This was not a natural death. This wasn't a death in what we call Seva Tova in old age, but rather this dramatic end to Shaul's life is meant to draw our attention to his life's failures. Okay. So that's what we have in Divari Amim. I think that that's also what he, the message that he gets from Shmuel when he does go to this witch in Endor and she kind of calls up Shmuel and Shmuel tells him, you know, you're going to lose the kingship and tomorrow you're going to die. Why? Because you didn't listen to God and 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 you didn't you, you know because of your failures right one ha one doesn't have to go into all the details but I think both of these psukim suggest that Shaul's failure is what led to his premature death and this idea is very much picked up by the uh, the following midrash which I brought for you here which is a midrash in Vaikra Raba which it, uh, which tells us as follows Amar Rabbi Yehoshua de Sachnin b'Shem Rabbi Levi Milamecher Eo Kadosh Baruch Hu Moshe Dor Dor v'Shoftav Dor Dor Umlachav Dor Dor v'Chachamav Dor Dor Manigav Right God showed Moshe the future He showed him each generation their leaders their kings their judges. And then he showed Moshe, among other things, her ehu Shaul uvanav noflim He showed him Shaul and his sons dying by sword. And Moshe was very upset. Amar lefanav, melech rishon sheyamod al banecha yidaker becharev? Right, the first king that is going to, uh, is going to rule uh, over your children, he's going to be pierced by the sword? That's an appropriate death for him? Marla Kadosh Baruch Hu, this is actually quite a, a caustic answer. God said to Moshe, Vilia Talmer, you're telling me? Emorla Koanim Shaharag, go tell it to the priests that, that Shaul killed. Shahim Mikatragimoto, they're the ones who are pushing for him to die in this way. So again, the Midrash is clearly going in the direction of Shaul's death, is very much a product of his death his life's decisions, his life's mistakes, right? And the Midrash goes on and says, Al chamisha chataim neherag oto tzadik, right? This Midrash says he was killed because of five specific sins. All right, we won't go into all the details. What I wanted you to see on this screen is just that there does seem to be some sort of consensus that Shaul's death is a result of his own misdemeanors, of his own mistakes, of his own sins. And therefore, I think that the Tanakh spends so much time in his death. Now, I'm going to go in a, a very specific direction, which is not exactly the direction that we see here in the Midrash or even in the Psukim, and that is to try to understand what we can see from the death stories that may give us an insight into why Shaul is cut off, not just cut off in the middle of his life, but cut off in terms of not being given the dynasty of kingship. And the answer, of course, is not sins. Because everybody sins, right? David sins, right? That David says it about himself that he sins. But David doesn't lo lose the dynasty. There's something specifically about Shaul's particular um, misdemeanors which disqualifies him from kingship. And in order to see that, I think we have to look at the death stories. I think the death stories are going to give us insight into that. But before we get back to those death stories, I want to talk a little bit about what Shaul's what what Shaul's uh, job was, what tasks he was given, what is what what is he meant to accomplish in his position as the first king. So <clears throat> I'll begin by saying that to launch the kingship, Shaul was actually given two battles, right? Two jobs. The first one is he is meant to battle the Plishtim. Right, that is the reason that he is chosen. Right in the, the 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 first book of Samuel, in chapter nine, God tells Shmuel, "Tomorrow I am sending you a man from from Binyamin, 
right? So that he can save my people from the Philistines. That's his main job. That's his first job. But the second job that I want to draw our attention to is a different battle. And that is a battle with the Amalekites, right? So we know this not, not, not from the beginning of the Shaul story, but we know this from um, from from Chazal, right? From different rabbinic sources, which inform us that there were three mitzvot that Am Yisrael was given when they enter the land. The first mitzvah is to set up a kingship, right? And the second one is to get rid of Amalek, to get rid of this evil from the world. The third one is to build the Beit HaMikdash. Uh, when the Ramam describes this, when the Ramam unpacks this, he, uh, he, he indicates that this is the order, right? First, you have to set up a kingship. And then that king, his first task is to get rid of Amalek. So actually, it seems as though in order to launch the kingship, Shaul has two military goals. I'm going to suggest that they're not, not necessarily exclusively military goals, but they find expression within a military context. The first one is to battle the Philistines, and the second one is to battle Amalek. And that um, uh, story really comes to fruition. It begins to, um, to, to, to um, find it, its expression in the 15th chapter of the first book of Shmuel, when Shmuel says to Shaul, Oti shalach Hashem lim shochachal melech al amal Yisrael, God, has sent, God sent me to anoint you. And now I want you to hear the word of God. What is the word of God? God says, Lech vihikita et Amalek. Go and destroy Amalek. Right? So this is very much linked to the, the reason that Shaul is anointed, right? When Shmuel comes to Shaul, even though it's, you know, quite um, uh, uh, a few chapters into the beginning of his kingship, it's not, it's not uh, presented at the very beginning of his story, but it is linked to his anointment, right? So that Shmuel comes in and says, listen, I made you king, but one of the reasons I made you king is so that you should go and, and, and battle uh, Amalek, right? And so this seems to be, these seem to be the two goals of Shaul. Now, uh, um, uh, uh, one of the things that I think that is really important to note is that when Shaul is told by Shmuel that he has lost the kingship, he's in the middle of a battle. Which battle is he in the middle of? Well, first of all, he's told in the middle of the battle with the Philistines. Shmuel comes to Shaul and says, listen, you did not keep God's commandment. Your kingship is not going to, it's not going to be established. Because you did not keep that which God told you. So the first time that Shaul is rebuked by Samuel and told you are losing the kingship was while he was battling the Philistines. And of course, I think many people know the second time that Shaul loses the kingship is when he is in battle with Amalek, right? When Shmuel comes to him after the battle and says to him, why didn't you listen to God's to God's voice? And now, you know, Yan Hashem, because you rejected the word of God, God has rejected you from being king. So it's actually interesting. Shaul has two kind of goals, right? He has these two um, uh, reasons that he was chosen to be king. And, and both of these stories end in failure, right? Shaul fails to properly battle the plishtim. And during that story, Shmuel says, you know, you've been rejected. And the same thing happens when he battles Amalek. So we do have a sense that there's something fundamental here that goes wrong in Shmuel's very in Shaul's very essential goals as king. But what are these wars about? Right? What does it mean that he's meant to battle the Philistines? What does it mean that he's meant to battle Amalek? Now, obviously, the most sort of basic level is well, these are our two enemies, so you have to battle them. But I'm going to suggest something a little bit of a more profound reading. I think that what the story is telling us is that in order to set up kingship that is successful in accordance with 
with, with the values of the Jewish people, Shaul has to launch his kingship by uprooting Philistinism and by uprooting Amalekitism, okay? He has to uproot what they represent, okay? Now, in order to understand that, <clears throat> let's look at what they represent, okay? What does it mean to fight Philistinism? Philistinism is a, a, a society that relies upon might. This is certainly not exclusive to the Philistines, right? We have it with lots and lots of different descriptions of different societies. I mean, you know, think of Egypt, right, with their uh, with their Rechev and and Sus and 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 Chayalim and right all that all their uh, mighty chariots, right? But the Philistines are really particularly described as relying on might. Every time the Philistines appear, they appear with some kind of military description, whether it is their numerical superiority. Look at how they're described here, as many as the sand, which is on the seashore in multitude, right? Or they are described as having really unique physical stature or physical prowess. Look at how Goliath is described as quite tall, govho, shesh amot vazaret. He is six cubits high, right? Um, or they're described, and this is, I think, also quite, um, uh, um, quite emphasized here, their armor is described, right? We have that, this also at the end of Shmuel Bet, we have this uh, Philistine warrior who is described as a man of great stature, who has six fingers on each hand and six toes on each foot, 24 digits in number, okay? Which again, it's this description of the kind of larger than life, almost monstrous Philistine warrior. And, and there is something that is very daunting about these Philistines. They rely on might, but in fact, they are really quite mighty, right? What does it mean to fight Philistinism? Well, I think that you know one of the reasons that people set up kingship is so that the king will be their protector, right? The king will protect them from all military um, uh, dangers, right? From all security dangers. There is a huge danger with setting up a kingship in this context. Why is that? Because the king can easily overshadow God, right? The king can make people forget that the source of victory is not the numerical superiority or the very well-developed um, uh, weaponry or the physical abilities, the physical prowess, but rather one of the great themes that we have over and over and over in Tanakh is that Kila Hashem Hamilchama, the, 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 the victor in battle comes from God's decision and not from human might, right? So many stories in Tanakh focus on that. We have the stories of the battles of, of, of the few against the many, the, the weak against the strong, the battles in which um, uh, the idea is in order to cultivate among the people this sense of reliance on God. Now, the minute that we have a king, we are in danger of not feeling that reliance on God, okay? <clears throat> so that when the people come to Shmuel and they ask for a king, and Shmuel, of course, is very angry at them, but eventually he agrees to give them a king, right? L look at what he says here. Right? The people refused to listen to Shmuel's voice. And they said, No, we want a king. We want to be like all the nations. Ushvatanu malkenu. We want a king to judge us. We want a king to go out in battle before us. And we want him to fight our battles. Now, that is all well and good. But first, the king has to uproot this notion that might makes right. Okay? The one who is obviously quite capable of doing that is not Shaul, but his son, Yonatan, right? <clears throat> Remember, Yonatan goes off, plunges into battle with the Philistines just all by himself along with his weapons bearer. And he says the words, 
כי אין להשם מעצור להושיע ברב או במעט. God has no trouble saving with many or with few. That's the kind of statement that we need to hear from Shaul. When Shaul fights Philistinism, he is meant to uproot from the people this sense that it is military superiority which leads to military victory. And just to give you a little bit of a sense of this idea really throughout Tanakh, at the beginning of the book of Shmuel, which is, of course, the book of the launching of the kingship, Chana sings a song, right? Uh, she, we have the Shirat Chana, and it's part of this song. She says the words, Kilo yigbar ish. It is not with strength that people overcome, right? Of course, we have in um, uh, Shirat Hayam, after the story of Yitzhak Mitzrayim, we have the people proclaim Hashem Ish Milchama, God is that man of war. And there are really many, many psukim in Tehillim which make this same point. Elev Arechev, the Elev Asusim, you know, those guys can use their horses and chariots. But we, we might use those horses and chariots. We might uh, utilize those same military, um, uh, um, you know, military apparatus, but that doesn't mean that we consider that military apparatus to be the source of our victory. And certainly we do not consider the human king to be the source of our victory. That is something that the Tanakh is battling over and over and over. Okay. Um, <clears throat> what is, uh, we're going to get back to this point in a few minutes. What does it mean to fight Amalekitism? So there's really a lot that has been said about Amalek, right? It's really uh, because I think it has so many uh, moral implications, uh, this particular uh, mitzvah of eradicating Amalek, really it has generated a lot of discussion. I'm just going to say one thing about it that is kind of based on a, um, uh, you know, uh, on, a, on an overview of the different places in which Amalek appears in Tanakh. Amalek appears in many different stories in Tanakh, not just in the story when they're coming out of Egypt and we have this idea that we will be battling Amalek forever, but they also appear in the story of Gidon, they also appear in the story of Shaul, they also appear in the story of David. All of these people fight the Amalekites. The one that I think is that is most uh, perhaps uh, instructive for our purposes is Gidon, because Gidon fights not just Amalek, he fights Midian, Amalek, and Bnei Kedem, the, the children of the East. And all of these three parties that Gidon is fighting are nomadic tribes. Now, uh, I, I think that part of what the Tanakh is, is, is saying here in particular when it comes to launching the kingship while battling Amalekism, right? I think that that it, 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 it it's drawing our attention to a society which doesn't work, right? The, the king is meant to set up a society, not just a society that views God properly, which is what we were talking about when we were talking about fighting the Philistines, but also a society that functions well between people. What is fighting Amalekitism? What is Amalekism? Well, first of all, what we're going to see, and we'll see this in a moment, is that um, the Amalekite, um, the Amalekite people, the tribes, are, are, are described as exploiting the weak. They fight battles for spoils, not for ideology. They do not invest in building. They don't invest in the future. They don't invest in constructing anything, anything that is uh, that would make the world better. They live from day to day, exploiting the world around them. And their categories of, 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 of survival are not categories that are moral categories. They're not looking at good and bad, but rather at what is useful for survival and what is not useful. Let's see a couple of examples of this. Okay, we won't see all the examples, but let's see a couple of examples. I think uh, perhaps some of you were thinking this, but you know, when Amalek does attack Israel on their way out of Egypt, who do they attack? How do they attack Israel? They don't attack from the front. They don't take pride in their 
uh, in their battle. They are picking off the weak and the tired and the helpless from the rear, from the back of the camp, right? They are just finding whatever spoils they can from war. I know that there are lots and lots of Midrashim that go in different directions with this, but I, I'm just going to stick with one um, uh, description of Amalek for now. Let's look at, at this description of, of Gid'on, right? The Gid'on story starts out by describing Amalek, Midian, Bnei Kedem. What would they do? So look at what's described here in Judges chapter 6. im Zara Yisrael, it would be that if Israel would plant a seed, the Allah Midian va Amalek Vnei Kedem, the Allah What would they do? These nomadic tribes would come and they would trample the, the fields, or they would come and strip the fields of their food. It's not clear, right? But look at Pasuk Dalit, they would encamp against them. et Yivul Haaretz. They would destroy the produce of the land. Now, destroying the produce of the land may be a result either of them stripping the land of its fruits without concern for the next season, right? When a farmer picks his fruits, when a farmer reaps his harvest, he does it in a way that, in, that, that of course, preserves the fields for the next planting because he cares about his fields. When a nomadic tribe comes in and is planning to leave tomorrow, right, is not planning to, to, to stick around, it's just exploiting the, the fields, he allows himself to destroy the land as he takes the food. Let's see one more example. And this is in the story of uh, David fighting Goliath in uh, Shmuel, uh, sorry, David fighting Amalek. I'm sorry, uh, hold on one second, please. Sorry, I apologize for that. Um, and when we have this story of David fighting Amalek, so we'll, we'll maybe see a little bit more of this story afterwards. But what I want you to see is that David is, uh, his his city is raided by Amalek and they take spoils of war. And unfortunately, they also take uh, hostages. And so he goes to free those captives. And on the way, he finds this man who this this uh you know lying by the side of the road he basically seems you know half dead and you know he hasn't eaten in 3 days and he says to the man what are you doing here on the side of the road and look at what the man explains look at this part that i highlighted for you in blue the yomer narmitri anochi eved leish amaleki i am a servant to an amalekite man va yazveni adoni ki khaliti hayom shlosha right? My master abandoned me because I was sick, right? I was sick for, for three days ago. So he tossed me to the side of the road. Again, this um, uh, reflects a certain kind of morality in which, A, you know, you exploit the, the those around you, but you're also not willing to invest in those around you. If someone is weak and they are not useful, you toss them to the side of the road. We measure the world by useful and useless. And then, of course, uh, David finds the Amalekites. And what does he see them doing? Right? Look at this part that I, that I um, in the second to last line here. Um, he sees these Amalekites spread out in the valley. What are they doing? They're eating, they're drinking, they're enjoying all the spoils of war. They do not put anything away. They put nothing in the pantry. They are not saving for tomorrow because tomorrow they'll raid the next town, right? Wars are fought for spoils, not ideology. People are measured by useful and useless. The weak are exploited. And this is the kind of morality that does not, does not, is, is not, it doesn't create a good society. You can't construct a society when that morality is somehow floating around in the world. And so I think that when Shaul is being instructed to fight the Philistines and the Amalekites, as part of the story of launching kingship, what he's really being told is, is that before you uh, can set up 
a healthy, vibrant, and spiritually pro, uh, deep society, you have to rid your society of any of these kinds of attitudes, whether it's an attitude that could uh, somehow uh, disrupt your reliance on God, that could be bad for the Ben Adam Lemakom uh, relationship, for the relationship with God, or whether it's some attitude that is a, a residual Amalekism, which is floating around in which people think um, uh, are not thinking within the broader societal framework. And, and, and those two things, Shaul is meant to have his eye on at the beginning of his kingship. Okay, so now that I've, I've sort of spelled out what I think uh, Philistinism is and what Amalekism is, I want to go on and 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 see what actually goes wrong in the Shaul story. In the in the Shaul um, uh, story, so the first thing that I think that is important to note is that Shaul, it's not just that he fails to fight the the Plishtim, right? That's I think a little bit too simplistic. I think he fails to uproot Philistinism from within himself. Okay, Shaul walks around, and if you look on the left side of this screen, you'll see it here very clearly. He walks around with, in his hands, with a spear, with a sword. Okay, this is very, very different than David, right? What does David walk around with in his hand? With the musical instruments, right? What are the musical instruments for? They are for communicating with God, right? The, this, the, the sense with Shaul is, is that Shaul has developed this kind of over-reliance on the sword, okay? Now, we see this not just in, in, in the fact that he walks around always with these uh, weapons in his hand, but perhaps even more significantly in some of the stories that revolve around Shaul. I brought for you one example. It's it's not the only example, but I brought for you this one example in which uh, David uh, comes to Shaul. Well, Shaul hears the words of, of Goliath, the Philistine, and he sees how Goliath is decked out in armor and is this, you know, really kind of monstrous figure. And Shaul is absolutely terrified along with the entire nation. And again, you know, being terrified of um, of physical might is a problem for the king. We want the king to be able to say the words of Yonatan. God has no trouble saving somebody, somebody who's mighty or somebody who is weak, right? God doesn't have trouble saving them. And who is it, of course, that counters Shaul's uh, fear of this Philistine of Goliath, Shaul says to David, you can't go fight that Philistine. You're just a boy, right? And David says, no, no, I, I, God will help me. I'm okay, right? But even before Shaul sends David into battle, he tries to dress David in his armor. He puts this kova nechoshet al rosho. He puts shiryon on him. He puts this, 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 um, this, this brass helmet on his head and he puts armor on him. And that armor and that brass helmet, that reminds us of the, the, the Philistines' own armor. And David says, I can't even walk in this. I, I'm not, I don't need to go out into battle with armor, right? Again, you know, without uh, uh, suggesting that we're meant to rely too much on miracles, there is this notion that the launching of the kingship has to be done with a very clear statement of who is the one that brings about military victory. And Shaul absolutely cannot make that statement because even at the very end of his life, look at this Pasuk that I brought for you at the bottom right of the page, um, when Shaul uh, is, is, is in his final battle with the Plishtim, he sees the camp of the Plishtim, Vayira Vayecherad Libo Me'od. He is afraid, his, he is trembling, his heart is terrified. And this is, you know, this is at the moment that he goes out into battle with these Philistines, he never really excises that fear of military might from within him. So how can he possibly teach that to the people, right? He doesn't, he doesn't, he doesn't digest himself of that Philistinism within himself. Okay, what is his failure to fight Amalekitism? So here I want to uh, show you two things. First of all, when God tells Shaul to fight the Amalekites, 
he, he through Shmuel, right? Shmuel brings the word of God to Shaul to fight the Amalekites. And he says to him, I want you to destroy the Amalekites. And he creates these very sweeping categories. You have to destroy them all. Well, we won't get into the, 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 the moral questions here, right? They embody evil. They have to be uprooted completely from men and women, everybody, all animals, everything has to be destroyed. And when Shaul does not do this, and he explains why he leaves some of the Amalekites alive, he creates very different categories than the one that God gave him. Or, or when the Pasuk tells us why Shaul uh, chooses to leave some of the Amalekites alive. Look at what he's, look at what it says here. Vayachmol Shaul va'am al agag al meitav ha'tzon v'habakar v'hamishnim v'al akarim v'al kol ha'tov. Right? What is what does Shaul leave alive? Everything that is good. What well, what is good about animals? Useful, not morally good. Right? V'chol ha'melacha nimivza v'nameis. But all of the all of the things that were like useless, that were just not really helpful to him. That's what he destroyed. In other words, Shaul is dividing the world into the Amalek-like categories of useful and useless. And that's why he leaves the king alive also. The king is useful. And this is not a moral category. If it was a moral category, he would have left the children alive. But he is creating categories that remind us very much of Amalek. And of course, even though he was told um, uh, that that in order to fight Amalekism, he has to be very, very clear that he's not taking any spoils. Because remember, Amalekites fight wars for spoils. In other wars, um, the, the Tanakh does allow us to take spoils. But in this uh, war, we're, we're told very explicitly, you cannot take spoils. The reason you can't take spoils is, be is because you're not just fighting Amalek, you are fighting the values of Amalek. You are fighting what Amalek represents. Okay, so Shaul fails to uproot this from within himself. And so I think that this is really the failure that we're talking about. When we talk about <coughs> why Shaul is uh, rejected from kingship, it is because he fails to fight um, uh, what 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 the plishtim represent is because he fails to fight what Amalek represents. And this takes us back to, in our last few minutes of this year, this takes us back to his two death stories. Look at how his first death is within the context of Philistinism, okay? Right, what, what is the story? What actually happens here? The, the, the plishtim are chasing Shaul and the, 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 the war is very, very heavy. And the archers uh, catch Shaul in their sights. And he is extremely afraid of those archers. And at that point, he says, I'm afraid that these Philistines are going to come and they're going to pierce me and they're going to torment me. And so he takes his sword and he uses it to bring about his death, right? Do you see how it's Shaul's failure to uproot Philistinism from within himself that ultimately leads to his death? He is afraid of military might. And of course, he dies by his own sword, which I think is an ironic kind of representation of his over-reliance on his sword, right? And what is the next and, and uh, story of his death? In this story, the word Plishtim never appears. The featured figure is an Amalekite. And the Amalekite shows up at David's doorstep and says, listen, I have a story to tell you. The story is the story of Shaul's death. And David says, okay, what happened? Tell me how they died. And this Amalekite says, well, you know, I was walking along on Har Gilboa and I saw Shaul leaning on his sword. Now, this is this is one of the silliest moments, I think, in, in the story. I was walking along in Har Gilboa. Who does that? Who, who goes to a battlefield 
to take a stroll? Why is he taking a morning walk on the battlefield? And the answer, and the answer I think is very simple. Because he's an Amalekite. He's searching for spoils. He's an opportunist. He's looking to see whether or not he can find spoils of war. Okay. And what does he find? He finds the grand prize. I'm not sure he's not tracking the grand prize. But of course, what is the grand prize? The grand prize is Shaul with his crown jewels. And of course, when 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 uh, when when uh, Shaul sees him, he turns him and he says, "Who are you, Miata?" And this young lad says, "Amaleki Anochi. I am an Amalekite." Right? Everybody talks about the fact that these are the last words that Shaul hears in his lifetime. Right? It's so ironic, but everyone thinks, "Wow, Shaul must have felt so threatened and so um and so chastised by the words." And I actually think the opposite. I think Shaul is thrilled that it's an Amalekite because he knows that an Amalekite has no scruples and will, without any hesitation, give him that death blow so that he can make off with the crown jewels. Okay. And so at the end of the Shaul story, we're going gonna, gonna to need to end in like two minutes. Yeah. Okay. So at the okay. end, story, what we really have here is uh, two deaths, which I think reflect his two failures in his life. We have his death as a result of his failure to uproot a Malachitism from within himself. And we have the death that takes place because he doesn't uproot Philistinism. And of course, in both of these areas, it is David who excels, right? David is uh, both successful in his war against Philistinism and we can't do it today because we missed the first few minutes of the class. Um, but he also, I think, is really uh, outstanding in his um, in his attempt and his ability to uproot this idea uh, of Amalekitism. And perhaps uh, we'll do that another day. All right. Very nice to see you all. Wish you all a continued um, uh, good learning and a good summer with uh, Isoro Tovot.